Okay, in this video, I'll show you how to calculate average and instantaneous rates of, what's the word? Oh yeah, change. So first, the definition. The average rate of a function f of x on an interval from a to b is, we'll call it a rock, average rate of change. All it is is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And if that sounds familiar, it should, because it's nothing but the slope of the secant. So here we have a little octopus, but oh wait, it's not an octopus because it only has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven legs. So if we draw another leg here, and we'll let that other leg represent our function f, which is a nonlinear function, maybe we're interested in the average rate of change of that leg on the interval from a to b. Well, all we do is we find the y-coordinate at a, we find the y-coordinate at b, and those are f of b and f of a, respectively. And we sub subtract the y-coordinates, f of b minus f of a, and then we subtract the x-coordinates, change in y over change in x, and that gives us the average rate of change on that interval. Look at an example. Find the average rate of change of the function f of x equals log base 2 of x plus 6 on the interval from 2 to 10. So you'll be given a function, you'll be given an interval. And in order to calculate its average rate of change, you just find the slope, change in y over change in x. So, change of y will do log base 2 of x plus 6 when x is 10. So that's log base 2 of 10 plus 6, or 16, minus log base 2 of 2 plus 6. That's log base 2 of 8, all over b minus a, the width of the interval, 10 minus 2. Okay, and I can work out the numerator there because log base 2 of 16 is asking the question 2 to what power is 16? That's the fourth power. 2 to what power is 8? That's the third power. And then 10 minus 2, I'll work that out in the next step. So 4 minus 1, 4 minus 3 is 1 and 10 minus 2 is 8. So there's my answer, 1, 8. And before we get on to the next example, just here's a quick graph to show you what we just calculated. The log function shifted six units to the left. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's the asymptote at x equals negative six. It'll go through this point, x equals negative five. It'll be really steep there, and then it'll level off dramatically. If we were looking at the interval from two to ten, here's x equals two, here's x equals ten. Basically, what we just calculated was the secant line connecting those two points. That's the average rate of change on the interval from 2 to 10 for that particular function. Let's look at example 2. We're asked to find the average rate of change of another function on another interval. This time we have f of x equals the square root of x plus 1 minus 4 on the interval from 3 to 24. So the average rate of change is nothing but the slope. We'll do change of y over change in x. Change in x is just going to be 24 minus 3. Change in y will be f of 24 minus f of 3. So I'm plugging 24 into that function and evaluating, plugging 3 into that function and evaluating. So the square root of 24 plus 1 is the square root of 5 minus 4. This gives us 1. The square root of 3 plus 1 is the square root of 4, which is 2. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Make sure you pay attention to the two negatives there. And that's all over 24 minus 3. 1 minus negative 2 is 3, and 24 minus 3 is 21, and 3 over 21 is 1 7. So we just found the slope, that curve, on that interval. Another example, this one's a little different. It says the expression below represents the average rate of change of some function f on some interval from a to b, and we're asked to determine f, the function, and the interval a, b. You might think at first that the function is 2 to the x, because I see 2 to the 6th and 2 to the 4th. Well, that would mean my interval was from 4 to 6, and that doesn't match with what I see in the denominator. Instead, I think the interval must be from 1 to 3, because, oops, 1 comma 3, because you can see that very clearly in the denominator there, b minus a, 1, 3. The function then, well, it would involve 2 to some power, but I'd have to think 2 to the what power, uh, if x is equal to 1, would give me 4. So I need to add an additional 3 onto that. 
2 to the 1 plus 3 would give me 4. And then 2 to the 3 plus 3 would give me 6. So my function should be 2 to the x plus 3. When you're working those out or you're trying to figure out problems like that, use the denominator to help you with the interval. Use the numerator to help you with the function itself. Okay, another definition. This time without an octopus. The instantaneous rate of change of a function f at a point x is... So what we're trying to do now is we're going to try to change the game. Instead of talking about the rate of change of a function over an interval, we're going to look at the instantaneous rate of change at a single point. How fast is a function changing at one particular point x? And the way we go about this is first we look at it over an interval. But instead of calling the interval from a to b, I'm going to say it's an interval from x to x plus h. See, a and b are just completely... independent of each other, but when I call the interval x to x plus h, this gives me some control of the width of the interval. I can call the width of that interval h, because x plus h would give me x plus h. All right, so the height of the function there is f of x plus h. Okay, so how can I use this setup, which looks like an average rate of change, to describe an instantaneous rate of change? Well, I'll start by setting up the average rate of change. f of x plus h, that's like the old f of b, minus f of x, that's like the old f of a, over x plus h minus x, which is just h, that's like the old b minus a. And now what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to shrink this interval. I want to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is the idea of a limit. And a limit is something that we'll start studying now. We'll look at limits in different examples throughout the entire year. And by the end of the year, when you're ready to start calculus, you'll have a great understanding of what a limit is. So the notation will look like this, LIM for limit. And I want to look at what happens when H shrinks, when it gets really, really small, because that will make this interval really tiny to the point that we're looking at the rate of change just at a point X. So it's the limit as H goes to zero. That is the definition of the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, in the next example in this video, I'm not going to use anything with limits to answer the question, but I'm going to use the concept of a shrinking interval. And then in class, we'll start to develop this limit idea a little more. So here's our last example. Find the instantaneous rate of change, or estimate the instantaneous rate of change, of the function x squared at the point x equals 1. And how I plan to do this is look at a shrinking interval all build around x equals 1. So at first my interval is 2 units long from 1 to 3. And then it's 1 unit long. And then it's only 0.1 units long. And I can make it smaller and smaller and smaller, keep shrinking that interval to the point that I have a pretty good idea what the instantaneous rate of change might be. So for our first example, the average rate of change will be equal to f of 3 minus f of 1 over 3 minus 1. And since it's the square function, f of 3 is 9, f of 1 is 1, over 3 minus 1, and that's 8 over 2, which is 4. So in, with my first estimate, I could say the instantaneous rate of change is about 4. So let's see if we can do better. The next example, I'll say f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. This time I'll have 4, that's 2 squared, minus 1, that's 1 squared, over 2 minus 1. So that's 3 over 2, 3 over 1. Now my estimate's at 3. Got a little bit better. Let's make the average rate of change again. It'll be f of 1.1 minus f of 1, all over 1.1 minus 1. Okay, so if I square 1.1, I get 1.21, just like if you square 11, you get 121. If you square 1, you get 1, all over 1.1 minus 1. So that's 21 hundredths over 1 tenth. And that's equal to 2.1. Okay? We could keep going with this process and get a better and better estimate of the instantaneous rate of change. Or we could just take a guess after the few examples that we did at where this was headed. We saw 4 then we saw 3, then we saw 2.1. If you guessed that the limit of this process is 2, you'd be correct.
that is the instantaneous rate of change of x squared at x equals 1. And we'll be able to prove that within a few days. That's all for this video on instantaneous and average rates of change.